Okay, so good morning, everybody. That's the last part of the final conference of uh, Gene Switch. And uh, I am giving this uh, final talk to try to point as much as possible to, to give a message for achievements of the projects and perspectives for stakeholders. Uh, Gene Switch uh, has had, uh, sorry, wait, uh, yes, a quite ambitious global aim that was to deliver underpinning knowledge of the pig and chicken genome and also to enable the translation of this knowledge to the pig and poultry sectors. And uh, in doing this, I mean, in uh, trying to achieve this, we had uh, underlying questions about uh, can we identify and characterize the role of functional genomic elements with an attention on those that are active, poised, or repressed during development in the determination of the phenotypes of the adult animal? And of course, what is the relative impact of a genetic variation <coughs> of the functional and regulatory element of the genomes of the main production traits? Uh, we tackled these questions uh, with a consortium, uh, a quite small consortium compared to other European projects. You see all the members here. You have heard most of these people in the last two days. And uh, in addition to the uh, formal partners, we had also collaborations with uh, uh, breeding companies, in particular Aviagen, HyperBV, and the IFIP Association in France. And uh, of course, since the beginning, GeneSwitch is part, was part of uh, the group of the first 3H2020 that was then uh, joined by others uh, as a FANG project, as really indicated by the commission topic call. And uh, the idea, of course, is the one that you know very well now. <laughs> this is the picture that we show so many, so many times on how uh, as on the lessons of the ENCODE project in humans, assays by sequencing are used for annotating the different functionalities of a genome. And the functional maps are useful to unravel which bits of a genome are functional. And this is, of course, uh, pertaining different times, different cell types and tissues, different environmental constraints in order to decipher the genotype to phenotype or G2P link. Sorry. I forgot to. <laughs> in order to decipher the genotype to phenotype uh, link. And uh, this is, of course, fundamental uh, for fundamental science to link cell, tissue, and whole animal scale knowledge. And finally, providing information to accelerate the genomic improvement. And on the bottom, you see the FANG uh, global aims that are essentially the same. And uh, the FANG initiative has worked in the past 10 years to standardize core assays and experimental protocols, to coordinate and facilitate data sharing via the FANG data portal, and establish uh, suitable infrastructures for data analysis. And uh, Gene Switch, in, uh, in this effort, has also uh, contributed to co-build the FADA development. So here I placed Gene Switch uh, uh, a bit in the history of FANG. So at the beginning, we had this uh, paper published in 2015, the first white paper, where we were putting forward the concept uh, about uh, what functionally annotated maps are important as biological reference and for what, doing what. Uh, with a focus on main farm species, uh, but not only, because fang is always being addressed also in general to domesticated species. And starting with the annotation of few adult individuals. In the so-called uh, phase two of fang, the idea was to extend this to different uh, conditions like developmental stages, physiological conditions, environmental perturbations, and also additional species that at the beginning, 10 years ago, didn't have uh, so well annotated genome yes, yet. And of course, trying really to implement the genotype to phenotype. So uh, for example, implement predictive biology, 
with new breeds, phenotype populations, so not anymore just few animals, but also uh, real populations to, to characterize. And of course, in this phase, it was very important to involve industry. And uh, in, uh, at, uh, in uh, 2021, uh, we had this uh, uh, second uh, white paper, the fang to fork concept, where uh, some concepts were put forward on how to match the challenges of sustainable production for the uh, next decade. And it is from this that uh, actually there has been the uh, development and now is ongoing project uh, for the, uh, a new uh, research infrastructure in Europe that is uh, uh, Eurofang. And uh, in, uh, during the activities of GeneSwitch, we have uh, since the beginning worked towards uh, constructing these uh, developments together with the other H2020 projects that uh, started uh, in different times. I mean, Gene Switch, Bovereg, and Aquafang all started in 2018. Geronimo, Rumigen, and Holo Ruminant started uh, two years after, if I'm correct. And these uh, projects could uh, really make uh, uh, concrete clustering activities. I know that the Commission was quite surprised, but we were even exceeding expectations. And uh, uh, they had common features, common features uh, like core activities of functional annotation of genomes on the different species, fish, bovine, chicken, pig. Uh, they, they aim to, to implement the phase two, that is to use uh, the functional annotations, like uh, as it was in Gene Switch, quite a lot of energies, to design new models for genomic selection. Uh, to co-develop with uh, European industry and associations and organizations for breeding uh, the research, so as really full partners, not just collaborations, and with consistent efforts in uh, all the activities of dissemination, training, and networking ac activities. Gene Switch, uh, you heard quite a lot in the last two days. Most of you could f was were here or could follow in streaming. Uh, had uh, in this picture, we we have exemplified the concept and uh, uh, of the project. So you had. We had the first aim that was uh, functional annotations across tissues with a focus on different developmental stages in both chicken and pig. And uh, you heard in the, uh, on November 6th p.m. the talks given by the colleagues mostly involved in these activities. So Alan, uh, Archibald, Derbe Clock, Sylvain Fossac, Sarah Diabali, Martin, Martin Dirks, and Sebastian Gizar. In the aim B, using functional annotation for uh, precision breeding with the two different uh, parts. We had the talks in the morning by Marco Bing, Mario Callus, Maria Ballester, Bruno Perez, uh, Carl uh, Johan Rubin, and Andreas Kranis for what is uh, all around genomic selection and uh, genomic improvement. And the talks by myself and Andrea Rao on the uh, integration of epigenetics in this uh, framework project. And uh, uh, all gene, swing, gene switch outputs uh, have been really uh, conceived and uh, carried out and obtained in the context of uh, fair uh, processes, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And all these outputs are really available to the community in terms of data, metadata, primary analysis, pipelines that are open shared in the gene switch portal, uh, in, in the FANG data portal, and in the dedicated page for gene switch. And this data uh, and uh, metadata and so on are uh, uh, under the terms of the Fort Lauderdale Agreement and Toronto Statement, that is actually the data policy of a FANG action that has been uh, um, accepted and shared by all these projects. We, are, we have scientific papers that have been collected under Zenodo. There was, of course, in the normal uh, research engines to find uh, published papers and bioarchives and so on. Many, I would say, are still in progress. 
And uh, if we think of his results and uh, what uh, could be exploitable for stakeholders, first, uh, we had some exercise in discussing about this. And we think the estimated durability of the interest of his re results is about five, 10 years, depending on what. And uh, uh, here I put again also how we have disseminated as much as possible all this by the website, other websites that are connected, uh, including uh, Ensemble and so on for the build, and the social media channels. So if we think of the first objectives, sorry, think, yes. We think of the first objectives about the functional annotations across tissues and developmental stages. Uh, from the stakeholder perspective, uh, we work quite a lot to, to collect a repository of tissue samples for pig and chicken that is stored at the Serbian name of IRAE. And in here, we have uh, samples. Uh, some of them were completely used and are not available, of course, especially the samples from the early stages of development. Otherwise, we had made a biorepository of these uh, animals. You see the list of tissues in the descriptions. And this could be available because it could be interesting for some groups uh, in the community or whatever to, to say, OK, uh, look, I would like to to do some research on gonads or heart, and why not doing it uh, on the same samples, on the same animals that have been characterized at all levels already by the project. Uh, in the process of assays uh, during the optimizations that was, was done and uh, in the implementation, the Agenode, that is our biotech partner, actually uh, also decided to develop a commercial kit for uh, ATAXIC and uh, this is commercialized for some time already. Uh, so in principle, customers can have it ready to use uh, and easy, and it's one of the good kit, let's say, available on the market. And a very, very important outcome uh, that actually uh, contains also all the efforts uh, in the scientific terms, the publications that we are making and so on, it's the first ensemble regulatory bills for these two species by MBL. <coughs> so where all the genome annotation analyses are presented within an interactive genome browsers. And what this means as benefit for the user is uh, standardizations, uh, reusability, lower bars for new research, pre-computed annotations, accelerate research and enable science, lowers economic and environmental cost of research. And uh, the lead users and end users of this uh, global uh, uh, say achievement for this objective are academic and private laboratories, industry R&D uh, components, and also uh, the Eurofang uh, industry, I mean, uh, education, and finally also as end users, Eurofang research infrastructure. For the second objective, using functional annotation for precision animal breeding, uh, this is uh, quite a summary because, in fact, uh, there was an incredible amount of work developed on this uh, part. And uh, you heard also yesterday the presentations of the FAIF, uh, Functional Evolutionary Trait Irritability Scores for variants in pigs. In this case, uh, FAIF uh, where uh, scores were evaluated for their potentials in pigs as a way to prioritize NIPs. And the benefit for users is that they provide the proof of concept to use these scores to prioritize NIPs in genomic prediction for pigs and also for other animals. And the lead users in this case are animal breeding companies and particularly big farmers in this case. Another thing is that uh, quite big achievement of gene switch have been new innovative, uh, innovative genomic selection models that include the use of functional annotations that have been developed and also tested in commercial uh, populations. And uh, uh, I think there is still a lot of use for these models in the now and in the near future. And uh, it 
this has led to several scientific outputs uh, for evaluating the potential of using functional genomic knowledge to improve prediction in which cases, for which traits more possible than for others. And I would say that this research has opened really a Pandora vase because there is still a lot to, to discover on the use of these models and with new traits and so on. And the benefits, uh, together with all the extension measures that we are putting in place in World Package 6, this has provided a proof of concept for the stakeholder community, and it also paved the way to the projects that followed, like Geronimo, uh, that will make further use and, of course, uh, in, um, improvement to this work. Lead users, animal breeding companies, again, pig and poultry farmers. And finally, we had also this uh, part of the project on the epigenetic of diets. And this has uh, made exact, most of all a, a proof of concept, also the difficulties that you can encounter that were really enormous, to implement a, a large scale uh, experimental setting to see effects that were so uh, light and so faint, but still there, with some consequences that we don't know yet uh, about what phenotype could uh, what at the level of phenotyping could mean uh, in life of these animals. And these are data that can be exploited in further epigenetic studies. And we think it is most uh, important for researchers and also for educational purposes. And then the users, again, uh, researchers, industry, education, Eurofangery. Well. And then, uh, where I am now? About standardization of data and processes, dissemination and outreach, this is the third uh, main objective. So here about uh, uh, what I already said, in fact, but it's uh, the fair uh, resources. So protocols, metadata, uh, data, uh, analysis outputs, and you can see the description in the middle. So protocols that are available are made, are tested, they can be improved, of course, but this is the, main, the first standard, and as all standard in biology is evolving, but at least you, you have a process that is really controlled and can be uh, followed by uh, the community. Store metadata, row sequencing, but also store primary analysis outputs uh, for each experiment. Ready to use pipelines. A lot of work in gene switch was done really on pipelines for bioinformatic analysis. And uh, again, you see uh, the, the potential uh, benefits that are, I'm not going in the details again, in the benefits for users. And lead users and end users, uh, more or less the same. In this case, more uh, academic and private laboratories, industry, R&D. And at the bottom, you see uh, also the other uh, a synthesis, Chagla, maybe not complete, <laughs> of what is dissemination and outreach. So videos, glossaries, uh, webinars, also with Eurofang uh, research infrastructure, because at some point, really, uh, these activities of dissemination and outreach could uh, benefit of the uh, collaborations and clustering that had taken place between all these projects. And these are uh, support materials uh, dedicated to a large audience consumers, students, industry, professional actors, and so on. They, we think they are, they are being already used and they will be more useful in the future for training courses, genome annotations, genetics, genomics, and so on. And so it's a, it's a support for lead users like teachers, university lecturers, and, uh, and users, of course, students, education, public. Uh, overall, the main impacts of gene switch, uh, how we promised them at the beginning of a project, it's high quality reference annotation maps for the whole research community that I think uh, has been achieved, uh, in my opinion. Uh, cutting edge research results, paving the way to further studies and strategies. And uh, even here, I think that we made our, our job and uh, uh, ensure stakeholder, uh, European stakeholder benefits with an increased understanding of the value of functional genome annotations to face current and future challenges 
to achieve sustainable productions. And I think also in this case, uh, we have uh, kind of made the job. Uh, of course, many things could be uh, done better, as it is always the case. I also remind that uh, we had COVID after six months of start. So we had to face an incredible number of difficulties. We finished now in December after six months extension, but helped but uh, also complicated uh, things for other uh, matters. Anyway, I think we did uh, all the best we could. And I underline that as additional impact, uh, Eurofang and all these uh, things that we built together, uh, it's going to continue, uh, provides a great opportunity for large scope uh, genotype to phenotype research in Europe. And I would like to, to end here, and I give uh, uh, my final big thanks to all the participants in GeneSwitch uh, for this adventure, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Can I go? <laughs> So hi, my name is Tatiana Zerjan, and I am with Frédéric Pitel, the co-coordinator of Geronimo. Geronimo stands for Genome and Epigenome Enabling Breeding in Monogastrics. It's a European project that works mainly on pigs and chickens. And there is a little uh, transgenerational experiment in quails. This presentation is also, will also be done by Marius that will present to you uh, what is happening in World Package uh, 4 and the differences with gene switch. So we are all aware that there, were, there are many challenges that we are facing, a constant human population growth, environmental constraints. There are issues related to food security, and of course, a change in social cultural values. We are much more aware and uh, conscious about uh, the uh, environmental footprints of our actions. So Geronimo, what hopes is to provide readers with innovative genome and epigenome uh, enabling selection methods to improve chicken and pig production, guaranteeing diversity. And this is done by the use of a large set of omics technologies, both um, genetics and non-genetic mechanism controlling traits, as well as the study, uh, the approach of a multi-trait uh, analysis including production, quality, and quantity, efficient, uh, feed efficiency-related traits, productive, longevity, fertility, resilience. Oh, sorry. I was changing. Is it like this? OK. So it should work. It's true that it's hard to read from there, yeah. and it's hard to change, so. <laughs> Um, so, a, a large uh, set of traits that we called ELP traits to make it shorter. So, it's a large consortium. We are 21 partners from 11 uh, countries. And these include uh, academic experts, private companies, professional associations, experts in innovation management and expert in project ma uh, management. And as you have heard several times, we are part of Eurofund. So the project is organized around uh, eight work packages. Um, work package one, two, and three, which are in blue, uh, are really, um, let's say, the data production were packages um, where a large set of genetic and epigenetic data, mostly uh, methylation data, will be produced. Work package one um, is really uh, trying to look uh, at the genetic and epigenetic component affecting uh, LP, uh, ELP traits. Work package two that Carlos yesterday mentioned briefly, it's really the work package interested in the environmental um, impact on epigenetic changes. Work package three uh, looks at genetic and epigenetic diversity. Then we have 
two word packages, which are word package four and word package five, where, let's say, uh, analysis and, and models are proposed. So word package four will be uh, Mario presenting it, and word package five will be uh, Frank. And is the uh, word package looking at social issues related to uh, genomic innovation. Word package six is knowledge dissemination and multi-actor participation, and then we have the word package seven uh, for management and eight for ethics. So the activity really, the idea is to combine the genetic part, so analyzing the sequence variation, and the epigenetic modification related to environmental changes. And in, in the project, we are really looking at uh, transport and rearing condition changes and impact that can have at early life stages, feed uh, quality, uh, ambient temperature, age of the animals. So all these environmental changes and their impact on epigenetic modification to try to better understand the component contributing to phenotypic variation. So the project, of course, will lead to the generation of a large set of genetic and epigenetic data. And with this, the aim of work, main aim of work package one and two is really to identify underlying biological mechanism affected rate variation. And the work package three is to map genetic and epigenetic diversity on local breeds and propose strategy to optimize the conservation of genetic and epigenetic diversity. So what is new in Geronimo? <laughs> well, we think that there is a change of scale in number of animals and breeds uh, studied. There will be, and there, well, it's ongoing, massive gen genotype and methylation that data production. Um, it is a, is a project that is focusing on a large range of traits related to production, asset efficiency, but also uh, welfare-related traits. And, um, yeah, I repeat that. Well, it's looking at a large number of commercial and local breeds. What do we benefit from gene switch? Well, the improved knowledge of the functional genomes will certainly enable us to go further in the understanding of biological mechanism affecting trait variation. And when I say a change of scale in number of animals, well, it is an ambitious project because what we will produce is around 6,000 genotypes from chicken and, and um, pigs, breeds, uh, in terms of epigenotypes, so mostly methylation analysis, we are around 10,000, uh, I would say, samples, because sometimes we repeat several tissues. Transcriptomic, we are around 2,000 RNA-seq data, and the collaboration of, with several um, private um, breeding companies allows us to have access to more than 90,000 genotypes and phenotypes. And all this amount of data is needed for uh, the, the analysis we will uh, perform. So there will be a lot of GWAS going on with classic phenotypes, with gene expression phenotypes, with DNA methylation patterns in order to identify QTL, EQTL, and MEQTL for a large, large range of traits, as well as we would like to develop the EWAS um, approach so use the methylation information plus classic phenotypes in order to identify QTM. So what is the impact of work package one and three? Uh, I will let then Mario discuss our work package four. So the, uh, we will uh, implement high throughput, non-destructive, low-cost phenotypes, implement a genome-wide cost-effective tool to perform parallel genotyping and epigenotyping on a large number of individuals, identify biomarkers for early uh, prediction of male reproductive quality in pigs and detrimental behavior in chickens, um, develop epigenetic toolboxes to identify whether animals have been exposed to detrimental uh, conditions, stress, in the production environment, 
rainfall knowledge on genetic and epigenetic mechanism underlying trait variability and propose a set of options for conservation of genetic diversity and epigenetic um, diversity among and within breeds. As said, this large set of genetic and epigenetic data will benefit other work packages, like work package four, to develop and validate methods to improve selection strategies integrating functional information and non-genetic components. And I let... Okay, thank you. So what I will do is I will explain in a bit more detail what we will do in work package four of uh, Geronimo and how that relates or contrasts with what we uh, have been doing in work package four of gene switch. So um, in gene switch, as also you've heard uh, this morning and over the last few days, we've been uh, generating assays, um, uh, a lot of assays that cover the entire genome of, uh, of pigs and, and poultry and that say something at a population level of how important certain parts of the, the region of the genome are. And then we, we in work package four of genes, which we worked on uh, using those functional annotations and genomic prediction. In, in Geronimo, we don't look at this population scale uh, functional annotation, but we want to generate, or we are going to generate, individual uh, methylate, methylation uh, patterns. Uh, and then um, those are those uh, methylation patterns and gene expression uh, data we will use in genomic prediction models uh, to try and uh, improve that. So just to, for those that are not too familiar with that, to, to put it in a bit of a schematic overview, um, if we talk about genomic prediction, traditionally what has been implemented in the industry over the last 10, 15 years, is that what you need is a reference population to do this. And this reference population needs to have a large number of individuals, let's say a thousand of, or more, uh, and for these animals you should then have their genotypes, so you should know their, their DNA, so to speak, or the DNA composition, and you should have uh, uh, phenotypes measured on those individuals for whatever traits of interest that are in your breeding goal. So here the example could be feed efficiency and it could be, let's say, some uh, uh, growth-related trait or meat-related uh, trait. Now, um, in, in gene switch, what we then did is we, um, we looked at the genomes of individuals and we tried to, to pinpoint, based on the functional annotation, where we thought is the relevant in, uh, variation to explain uh, phenotypic variation. So that's what these little red arrows uh, on the DNA indicate here. In, in contrast, in Geronimo, what we we add another layer of information for the, for the reference population. So for these individuals, or at least a sizable subset of the animals in the reference population, we get an additional source of information, which we call other omics because it could be you know, gene expression, it could be uh, microbiome data, or it could be methylation data, like we are particularly interested in within, within Geronimo. So, uh, in terms of new models that have been developed within GeneSwitch, um, so there, what, what we try to do there is the traditional genomic prediction model just says, okay, we have 40,000 SNPs, we put them in the model, and then uh, we just take the total genetic variance, we divide this by 40,000, and that's the amount of variance that each SNP can explain. And then we, we try to relax this assumption by saying, well, if we know that this region is functionally very relevant, we can upweigh uh, the variance in that region. Or we're only going to select SNPs in regions where we know there's functional activity. Um, in contrast, in, uh, in Geronimo, uh, in addition to using the genotypes of individuals in genomic prediction, we will use those other omics, such as uh, the methylation profiles. And then the aim is to, to use that to help get a better grip on the, the variation in phenotypes and being better able to, to predict them, uh, but also breeding values of animals. So that's um, uh, the, just the take home messages of this. Uh, both projects aim to improve genomic prediction, uh, but, and it's using newly generated omics or genomics data that's either at a population scale 
uh, or at the individual level. And that's the connection, but also the contrast between uh, both projects. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Uh, oh, wait for the microphone. Sorry, I'm coming in in the middle, so apologies. This is a very simple uh, uh, question about methylation patterns. How heritable are those? Um, that is actually something that we'll also be looking at in, within Geronimo, but I think from literature, there is, is it much known about this? Can you say anything, Tatiana? Oh, you can take that. So in Geronimo, there is one experiment with quails that will be a transgenerational experiment, and that will allow to answer the question. Right now, I don't have the, <laughs> the answer. And, and even if it would not be heritable, it could still be related to the phenotypes we're interested in, right? So it could, and it can still be uh, relevant, yes. I'm also a bit curious about uh, how to interpret the results from uh, GWAS on the methylation. So then you would find associations that impact methylation at a certain place, is that? Uh... Yeah, that's it. So try to find the genes or the regions that might affect uh, methylation patterns, the GWAS. While the EWAS will be using, yeah using the methylation data in order to associate it with potential. So it's the genetic of the methylation a little bit. So, so they have a similar interpretation as EQTL in that sense, yes. Yeah. Uh, I may have missed it, but uh, uh, all these methylation profiles, on which tissue do you, do you have them? On blood or? So because there are so many different uh, phenotypes, we collect, well, the different experiments will look at different uh, tissues. So what Carlo was mentioning yesterday, so concerning the behavior aspects, so wealth, welfare traits, he collected at least, what, around 10 different issues and many from the brain, you know, to see if there are um, effects. We on chickens interested in longevity, so production longevity, we, because we, we repeated the sampling several times. We focused on red cells. Um, in Wageningen, they are interested in, um, in uh, fertility in males, and they work on uh, sperm. So there are different issues that will be analyzed. Any other question? Uh, hello, I am Donald Bruce, and I am on the Bob Reg project looking at public engagement, and I am not at all uh, familiar with the field of animal genetics, uh, so I am an ethicist. But um, you mentioned, this to Elisabetta, um, the durability of your results being five to ten years. Can you explain a little bit about what you meant by that? <laughs> it was interesting to me just to how long the sort of effectiveness of this on... Uh, production or on sort of development in general? I don't know if I can explain much better than that. It's an exercise that we made in the XCOM with other uh, people uh, to try to, to really generate the synthesis of what we have achieved, okay? So we made these tables and they say they must be maybe a bit uh, better elaborated but I showed them also because uh, they were made, but uh, it was a way also to not repeat again what was already said for two days. Five, ten years, because, uh, for example, uh, well, five years is what? It's uh, the full overlap there will be with uh, projects like uh, Geronimo and also others that we start after. And in scientific terms, we think it makes sense. On the other side, you can, up, you can have other outputs that uh, actually are longer because, for example, all these fair processes that we have implemented and uh, all the standards that are already available for the community, in fact, they could even be more than 10 years. It depends on how you look at it, you see. So I can be more precise than that. <laughs>
Okay, use the microphone, please. One of the actors in our game is, is, is um, a breeding company c CEO, and he has the problem of, I am projecting 10 years ahead in what will happen in the cattle population. How do I choose now for things that will happen s such a long time in advance? I just thought this is uh, quite an interesting question as to how far these things will take to get into the uh, production population, but who will be in and who will be also be out? But, but yeah, indeed, if you implement those things that we've found, and uh, if people start to implement this in a, a breeding organization before it hits the farm, that will be five years at least, right? Because it has to, they have to make a change in the breeding program that will eventually change their genetics, but before their genetics actually arrives on the farm, that can take also several years, just because of the structure of things, yes. So that question was complicated. <laughs> Uh, Ellen, please go ahead. You raise your hand. So, yeah. Uh, so to attempt to answer Donald's question, uh, if one considers genomic selection alone, it was conceived at the turn of the century, and it's continuing to have an impact on selective animal breeding to this day. And so uh, elements of gene switch were about refining that. So one could... I think it's not unreasonable to assume that those refinements will continue to have an impact in a decade's time. And in, in terms of the underlying um, reference genomes with their improved annotation, and th those are underpinning uh, research in the species where uh, we've been working with. Um, you know, the human genome sequence is continuing to have an impact and inform um, genetics in that species, and I have no reason to doubt that the improved reference genomes that we've developed in this project will continue to underpin research in the species we've been working on for decades to come. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. I think we have to proceed now uh, to the next uh, presentation by Frank. And thank you, Mario and Tatiana. <laughs> Otherwise, you, we, we get a nice presentation. Can I do your presentation? I, I don't know whether that will be so successful. Um, but, it, but, but it would be a nice, nice challenge of in, in interdisciplinary uh, cooperation. Um, yes, yeah, so, so um, after these nice presentations on um, what's going on in, in, in Gene Switch and, and Geronimo, um, we, we actually make a bit of a switch um, in, in this session, uh, which is also um, framed as, as a stakeholder session. Um, and the idea is, of course, um, how to, to integrate um, different perspectives and, and also um, the more societal and ethical um, parts of what's going on. Um, so what I would like to do with you is um, these four steps, um, actually as a preparation for um, the session we will do after the break. Um, so the first is why um, is, is the attention to the societal ethical issues um, needed in the first place? Um, to show that um, there is already discussion going on, but and there are good reasons to broadening the scope um, of that discussion. Um, there's also something that's going on in the two uh, projects where um, I'm involved in, in Bofrec and in Geronimo. Um, the importance of um, both stakeholder and public engagement um, and more practical, um, how um, could we um, do that? Um, so what, what um, are ideas of stakeholder and public engagement? Um, there are a few examples in both uh, the Geronimo and the Bofrec project, which is also something we will do um, after the break. Let's have a look. Um, so you could say, um, wh why to start with the societal issues um, in, in the first place? So, so what you already noticed, um, I think, um, partly in, in the question and answer here, but also in the presentations, um, uh, already um, here, um, we are uh, together with, with at least a, a number of people who like um, so the, the, the back side, so, so the mechanical part, um, and, and if you are a, a watchmaker, um, then, then probably you, you, you like this. So the, the 
interesting things on cell lines, on QTLs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and um, these have have merits in its own um, sense. And these are essential um, to have discussions, good discussions about um, uh, breeding and future possibilities. At the same time, for a lot of us, um, that backside of your watch is only to see how um, late it is and whether we are still in time. Um, and I think that also holds for breeding. Um, yeah, so, so the idea is that um, these innovations are most of the time an answer to all kind of um, scientific challenges, um, uh, societal challenges. Um, and just to give an example of um, the Geronimo project, um, I do not need to read it um, uh, 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 fully, but, but you already see. So when we designed Geronimo project, um, we said a few things about what we like to achieve. Um, and that's not only technical, not only scientific, it's about environmental constraints, about promoting food efficiency, about genetic diversity. And of course we can have empirical discussion about so, so what is um, genetic diversity, um, but it's supposed also uh, the idea that apparently there is something important um, about um, genetic diversity or there is something important um, about health and welfare. And that is where we make that step from the more um, technical or more uh, empirical discussions to discussions that are very close to um, what uh, plays in, in society and what we call um, ethics. The same as um, the claim that uh, a, a number of projects, uh, Geronimo included, says, well, we, we fit into the ideas of the farm to fork strategy. Um, we um, try to contribute to the SDGs. Again, um, a lot of empirical discussion about the whole idea, why should we be sustainable in the first place? That's an ethical question. I think maybe um, a, a lot of answers um, that will um, tell you why. Um, but it's um, an important part to show that even if we have sometimes very technical discussions here, they are embedded um, in a societal context. Um, that holds for, for, I think, a lot of parts in science, but especially in, in animal breeding, um, it's, it's even more prominent. Um, so I think breeding um, is by definition goal-oriented. I think the, the interesting discussion between uh, Donald and Rita, uh, Rita um, about the five to ten years, um, you, you, you pursue certain things, you have certain aims, you have certain goals, um, and that immediately um, enters this question, what kind of direction would you choose? What do you think um, um, to be um, important and what is the preferred direction? Um, technology, um, in, in a very broad sense, but holds here as well. Technology is never neutral. Um, you, you could um, develop a drone just to make pictures and you could develop a drone um, as, as a, a weapon in, in a war. Um, so that holds here as well. You could say, well, we're just looking at QTLs and these are very neutral. At the same time, you can make um, changes. You can make changes to the animal. You can do it for animal welfare. You could do it for production. Um, and maybe it's not the, even that either or um, a simple distinction. Um, so, and that has, has implications in terms of um, who will be in power. Um, um, what, what kind of um, uncertainties are you um, linked with and, and what do you think um, uh, is acceptable? And finally, and maybe that's, that's a very specific part for um, the, the way of breeding um, we are looking here, it's about animals. Um, and that makes, um, personally I would say, the discussion much more interesting, but at the same time, from a societal and ethical perspective, sometimes more complicated, because you see um, Europe-wide, but even beyond that, um, that the position of the animal is changing. So it's um, no longer just a thing that we can um, change to our um, uh, will and, and how we like it. Um, at the same time, we still do not have a kind of consensus within Europe to say, okay, well, this is the societal position of the animal. Still, it, it is something that you can own, that you can change. On the other hand, you see discussions about um, uh, acknowledging animals' um, values or even rights. Um, and it makes it complicated in this kind of, of discussion. So these answers are, um, as mentioned, never neutral. They're embedded in all kinds of discussion of what we think is, is desirable and is valuable. At the same time, um, and it may also a little bit reflect that we, we have a nice group here, um, but at the same time, we do not have a 150-person um, um, audience um, because, yes, there is discussion, but it's not um, headline um, newspaper issues. So you could say um, 
well, just leave it here. It's, it's a nice discussion among us, and, and um, don't make it too complicated. Um, however, the absence of public debate doesn't imply that there are no ethical issues. Um, and um, on the other hand, I also would say, even if there is not a fierce debate, um, that should not be a reason not to include um, other stakeholders or the, or the general public. You even could say it allows us to have good discussions um, and to include um, other stakeholders as much as possible to prevent that you, have, uh, that you end up in, in very polarized um, debates. Um, because we, we still have, um, for instance, in, in terms of genomic selection in, in BOFREC, um, uh, uh, in, in the literature already, uh, examples of effects of, of animal welfare, um, mostly unexpected or at least not unintended. Um, questions about increased monopoly, so the idea is, um, are still farmers free um, to choose um, their, their own breeds or are they becoming more and more um, depending on uh, breeding companies? Um, linked to general needs for good practice for farms and, and breeding. So do you have um, codes within the professional field um, that helps us to enable that discussion? Then what we did also as part of the BOFREC uh, project, to go with, with Kuhn Kramer, um, is to say, well, um, apart from, from um, very specific ethical discussions, it's sometimes good to, to have a, a step um, back and say, well, start from a kind of three scoping question. So the first is, which ethical concepts um, do you think um, are important to, to include in the discussion? Um, so what you, you still see is that um, a lot of the discussions is framed in terms of risk um, and, and sometimes a, a bit of animal welfare. And risk is the idea is that um, if what we develop um, is safe, um, then um, it's okay. Well, the question is first of how, how to define safety. Um, but even um, risks, um, how important they are, um, I don't deny that, um, is a too limited frame um, to have discussions on um, what we do in, in terms of breeding. Um, and that holds the same for animal welfare. If we discuss our relationship to, to um, animals, welfare is a very important part, um, but um, not all the issues that we have um, in terms of our relationship with animals can be reduced to animal welfare. A few examples um, from, from the literature, um, and the first is a review on um, genome editing in, uh, in animals, where it said, well, um, Animals can be harmed in, in other ways. Um, the EU uh, report on genome editing uh, comes with the concept of de-animalization. Um, a, a, a paper by Kuna myself, we talk about the concept of telos. Um, and in the um, Geronimo project, we also look at concept of empathy. Um, it's not, not that you have to uh, capture this, this all directly now, but it's just to show that um, we have a lot of different concepts, um, and that's not ethicists who um, come up or um, uh, design these concepts, but these are also quite often um, ways to capture intuitions we find um, in public discussion, so that people say, yes, it doesn't, may, may not really be an effect on, on the animal, but um, we change the animal, and, and we make it um, not into a being that we value, but much more as a thing. So that could be something like the animalization. So you um, make it to an object rather than to an animal. Um, so that's the first scoping question. What, what, what kind of concepts um, um, and how broad um, should that be? And I think it, it is, there is a need to be as broad as possible, at least um, at the start of the discussion. The second point in the ethical discussion is to um, see a tendency to only focus on what's new. Um, so to say, well, um, for instance, in, in, in uh, genomic selection, say, well, that actually is only a little bit accelerating of what we have done for, for ages. Um, and, and even met with, with uh, genome editing, um, well, yes, um, it, it's a bit new, but um, relative. Whereas um, the, the ethical discussion um, could be much more broad than only that sometimes tiny part that is um, strictly spoken new, new. So even if you have a technology that is in line with something going on, um, it still could um, imply that it will speed up a process or um, have an impact um, on what's going on. 
or, and that's sometimes frustrated if you're, it's your technology, it could be that this is just the tipping point um, where um, you get public discussion. So did you say, well, um, this is the small next step, which may be in itself not a huge um, change, um, but that is the reason um, why um, it's embedded in wider discussion, and for instance, livestock farming. Um, and that also links to, to the, the, the final one. You, you could say um, what we're discussing here is only about um, cutting edge steps in breeding technologies. That's it. Um, so we, we also have to limit ourselves to the discussion. At the same time, um, especially if you start to discuss with a, a wider audience, um, you immediately end up with discussions um, about um, where do we stand with livestock farming um, in the next five to 10 years? Um, how does it fit to um, uh, uh, global trade? How does it fit with um, small farming? So it's, it's at least important to be aware that what we are discussing here today is embedded in, in much wider um, debates. Um, like um, the, the, the things on, on, on global hunger or uh, climate change. So if we try to do this, and also after the break, to, to broaden up um, the discussion, um, uh, unfortunately that doesn't make um, the discussion um, immediately easier, and it also not always lead to um, easy answers at the same time um, that's not, I would say, a problem of the ethical discussion. It simply is a reflection of the complexity um, where we have to deal with. And it also allows us to be, um, what I mentioned, the, 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 as professional, be responsible in the sense that um, we have responses to questions um, from different types of stakeholders. Um, so also here, I think that there are a lot of um, stakeholders involved. Um, but the point is, of course, that there is not a, a simple um, line of where to include um, the, the stakeholder. Um, so it's important in, in terms of, of co-creation that you really um, try to um, uh, develop technologies uh, together with others, um, that you're aware of the, the broader set of, of interests and, and values. Um, but also, and I think um, that's already a, a nice thing in, in both, both the BOFREC and the General Nova project, to prevent that you have this type of discussion only at the end of pipeline. So that you already said, well, um, we have done wonderful research for four years, and then say, okay, well, well now we have to include um, society. Because then, um, well, it's never too late, um, but quite often you have um, made a lot of um, discussions in your research um, which make the discussion with others um, much more difficult. The problem, um, or at least the, the importance of both stakeholder and public engagement um, is that, at least um, from, from literature, and I think there, there are strong reasons to say that if you be uh, focused on, on responsible um, research and innovation, public engagement is not an add-on, um, but really an essential element and the other point is, if you try or, or remain only in your own bubble, um, you end up um, with probably great research, but you, you easily um, have a very small focus. And um, I, I do not know whether you can, can recognize the picture. It's, it's from the COVID period, and when we had the football matches um, without the audience, it's possible, but it's no fun. And I think that's, that's a bit of where we need to go with, with research as well. It's possible to develop all kind of um, uh, interesting steps within also animal breeding. But if you take um, stakeholders um, in, in a wide sense, so uh, both professionals and, and uh, general public into account, um, it, it really makes a difference. And, and you're playing a, a different game and most of the time a better game. Um, so then the question, of course, why? Um, so what, how, how to use them, um, and this is not a, uh, a, a full list, but you could say uh, you can use them as a source, so you can um, have an idea of how do people think about this, um, to enable them. So as I said, there is not so much public discussion about um, animal breeding at this moment going on. Um, but you could say, well, actually, um, it is important um, that there is a broader discussion about what we're doing here. 
But then we need to um, enable people um, and give them the concepts, the words, um, to also help us um, uh, to reflect and discuss. And another part is really to um, enable participating um, at the level of research, at the level of um, policy making. Um, so this is how, how we try to do that within the Geronimo project, uh, really to uh, be aware that, that there is the difference between scientific knowledge, ethical challenges, and societal challenges, but that they are integrated. Um, here we also deliberately um, made a distinction between the societal and the ethical issues because um, it could be um, that within society um, there are um, uh, arguments highlighted which probably all, always have an ethical issue um, but maybe from an ethical uh, perspective maybe not the most prominent or the other way around it could be that something is not mentioned in, in society um, which from a um, ethical analysis is still something that um, you could highlight and to be important. Still it's not easy. Um, especially if you have general public, um, we, we have all kinds of social media um, which sometimes very simplify um, discussions and um, we are doing great jobs um, and, and then someone still say, well, I don't buy it. <laughs> um, so th that's a difficulty. At the same time, um, here again, maybe this, this nice cartoon um, shows also a little bit that these haven't talked um, um, uh, before. Yeah? So if, if you try to um, uh, take um, others into account from the very start, um, do not know whether you, whether you can prevent it, but it helps. The other thing, and that may be um, also a challenge for um, uh, research and, and, um, and science, it's important to take um, public perspective into account. At the same time, um, it's important also to be aware of where you stand for yourself. So it's not to, the, the idea of public engagement is not that um, others fully um, develop or, or the, uh, sorry, determine our agendas, um, but at the same time, um, it's, it's no reason to um, exclude them from the start. Um, so there really would be a kind of two-way uh, engagement. It's, it's not only us telling them um, what they should know um, or us telling them um, uh, what will happen in five to ten years or ten to fifteen years, um, but really to, uh, to enable discussion to, uh, to do find um, um, a more way of, of dialogue. Um, two examples of um, how we did it in, in the Geronimo and the Bovrek project. Um, one, in the Geronimo project, we uh, developed um, and performed um, eight focus groups um, in eight, uh, four countries in France, Geronimo, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and Slovenia. Um, the idea behind the four countries um, is partly because they're consortium partners in Geronimo, um, but also that um, the hypothesis that um, it's also important to find um, national or, or, or regional arguments. Um, science is, is very much on the global level. Uh, you see that policy is quite often on a European level um, where a lot of public but, but even um, uh, also stakeholder discussions are embedded in specific context. Um, um, in the Netherlands we have uh, problems with, with nitrogen emissions um, which heavily um, influence um, all kinds of, of breeding. Um, if you are in a country where organic farming is um, very much on top of mind, it influenced that discussion. So that's what we just um, finished um, before summer, um, currently um, working on, on the results. Um, and for instance, also in, in, as a spin-off, we, we did with uh, the uh, National Science Week um, last October, um, a dialogue with, with families um, on human animal relationships and technology. Just that's a, a, a very open this way, more in terms of um, enabling them to have um, discussions. Um, another part um, in the, in the BOFREC uh, project, um, uh, Donald and Anne are, are here as well, um, we developed the, the DEMOX game. Um, if you want to uh, know more, um, exactly, uh, the, the result is there and, and uh, Donald and Anne Bruce will, will be here during lunch as well, so please consult them. But it's also a way of um, bringing in the knowledge from the BOFREC project um, into uh, a public discussion but again, that's not only uh, for those out there, um, but it also proved to be very interesting to have this discussion um, among um, scientists and wider professionals. 
So what we'll do um, after the break is actually to have an idea of what kind of, of ethical and societal issues do you think um, um, to be important, um, but also, and that's the focus for um, this, uh, this uh, session after the break, how could we integrate them um, into policy? That could be um, company policy, but also on a governmental level, um, and what is necessary um, to improve that process. So to figure out what kind of hurdles um, you see um, and how could it be uh, done. Two rounds, um, so we have round one, 35 minutes, um, you will have a scheme, um, I will share that later on. Um, define um, in your small group um, a, a number of topics where you think um, this is uh, related to um, ethics in society for the gene switch or the Geronimo or maybe Bofrek um, as well. Um, the question, are these sufficiently addressed um, in policies? Yes or no? And why, uh, why, why not? Um, and then try to list um, what you think are hurdles um, in order to deal with these ethical and societal issues. Try to be as specific with the hurdles as possible because the idea is that we switch so you get the hurdles from the other um, and you are asked um, to, in round two, um, explore um, ideas of how we could overcome um, these hurdles and formulate best practices. And prepare, and that's why we have five minutes more in the second round, um, a, a short presentation um, where we can exchange our ideas um, at noon. The acknowledgements, because I'm standing here, um, I already mentioned um, Kuhn and, um, uh, and, and Donald Bruce, um, but um, there are a lot um, who made this possible, so many thanks for them. Um, I quickly go to this scheme, because then I do not need to introduce it after the break. Um, this is what will be uh, the scheme I, I'll ask you to fill in. Um, these issues, um, Need to be four. Uh, need not to be four. Um, if you have five, that's fine as well. If you have three, um, so that's that's still open. So think about your own, and try to fill in this. As I said, um, but especially these hurdles um, are um, uh, do not say the most important, but at least would be nice um, as a uh, final result um, uh, after those 35 minutes. Um, and then in the second session, um, you get the hurdles from um, the first group, um, and then the question is, um, how could we improve on that? Any questions so far? Then it's uh, 10.30 and time for, for, for a break. So I look at the show. Yes? That's just here. Okay, so we have 15 minutes break, and then um, given the group, so, so we'll, we'll split in two groups, so let's say one table over there, one over there. Um, feel free to um, sit wherever you like, um, and also online there will be um, breakout sessions um, that you, and you will, yeah, great. Two groups online as well, perfect. Okay, so uh, we weren't that many people in the online session. So it was uh, Ellen, Tina, and we three ladies. <laughs> but it was a nice discussion. Anyway, so we, for, uh, we found two issues. One was the transparency on uh, agri-food systems. And the second was, was about education, about genome editing, and defining or missing information about it, about the new technologies. Um, the relevant stakeholders are mostly everybody <laughs> in the sector, uh, but also a big focus on the younger generations and consumers and general public. Uh, but of course, we also have to uh, network with the policymakers. Um, so, is the tra if we go from transparency, uh, we thought uh, that it is addressed a little bit about, uh, with the labeling systems, uh, but it needs further standardization. Maybe another system uh, which is very easy to understand by the consumers, like the uh, DOPs, the Protect Geographical Indications, if needed. And at EU level, I think uh, we should definitely involve the supply chain uh, for these policies if there are going to be regulations uh, to solve these problems. So we should come into a joint agreement uh, with, uh, within Europe. 
so not national or regional basis. But uh, the main hurdle uh, that prevents the inclusion of this, these are uh, these in the policy, is the lack of co collaboration between different stakeholder groups. So uh, also even leading to refusal of even discussion discussing it. Uh, for the uh, missing miss, missing information or misinformation about the technologies. Um, we think uh, it is somehow addressed in the governmental policies, but it needs better distinguishment of different technologies. At the moment, it's under uh, GMOs, and it needs, uh, I think, better distinguishment. And it could be further embedded, uh, but more on a holistic point of view. Maybe, I don't know if somebody wants to explain it better. Uh, but there is quite a lot of uh, uh, lack of knowledge uh, knowledge exchange and uh, the technologies, uh, uh, there is no technology to identify gene editing at the moment on the product uh, level. So how are these addressed? How could these be addressed? Uh, well, mostly uh, with the lack of collaboration, we thought there could be uh, maybe some cost actions, some other uh, projects that is mostly focusing on the networking or, yeah, uh, joining different stakeholder groups uh, in a wider, uh, broader coverage. And uh, science-based communication, which is quite simple to uh, explain, simple to understand by um, the young generations especially, but in general, the public. And for the gene editing, um, of course, the technology needs to be uh, there to identify gene editing so that it could also make it easier maybe for the consumers to understand uh, if, if we have it here or we don't have it, since still the imported foods uh, are also coming from an origin of gene edited uh, plants and animals or not. So this is an important technology to uh, invent, invest in. And we also have to uh, address the hurdles with uh, scientific evidence, especially focusing on the future challenges like how we are going to feed the world with organic production and small, uh, very small, uh, or very, I mean, um, like romantic, idealized farming systems. So that's why we have to cooperate with uh, interdisciplinary researchers and uh, areas like human geneticists as well as com communication a lot. And uh, yeah, I think, did I miss something? Yes. I don't know if you did it right, but you did it right. Yeah, so uh, the first uh, group I had uh, on the table uh, discussed uh, quite a, a range of topics, but we ended up uh, spending most time um, discussing increasing efficiency as a breeding goal um, and a breeding goal with uh, uh, a societal uh, relevance, uh, namely not just to increase profits um, in uh, animal agriculture, but also to help feed the world and uh, at the same time um, limit the environmental impact of um, animal agriculture. Um, this topic um, uh, led to the identification of quite a range of stakeholders um, as well, inc including companies, uh, where uh, a question was, so um, is every company um, equally uh, uh, able to um, uh, yeah, make use of this increase of um, efficiency, or are only the large companies uh, able able to do that? Consumers um, may profit uh, from um, having uh, uh, access to, to 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 good and cheap foods. Um, animals are also uh, were also mentioned as uh, relevant stakeholders, um, um, and well, it was considered uh, uh, an important issue an important trait to, to, to work on for these uh, societal reasons, um, but uh, we, we, we struggled a little bit uh, to, to, to identify uh, the ways in which uh, uh, improving efficiency was already also on the, the policy or, or legal uh, agenda. Um, well, it was clear that there is research funding for projects um, aiming to impro uh, improve efficiency by means of um, other uh, breeding methods than genome editing, at least. 
um, um, there uh, uh, are already uh, through the common agric agricultural policy um, some uh, stimuli to to breed feeds locally that that animals can uh, can consume um, but uh, well there there uh, there may be more ways to um, uh, include this in, in policy and law um, and um, well one of the options that we discussed was uh, st stimulating longevity as a as a breeding goal and so animals uh, at least uh, uh, who produce uh, other products than uh, than meat uh, uh, are more uh, efficient in, in that way um, and uh, trying to stimulate circular production uh, so the use of waste streams uh, uh, as feeds um, but there are also uh, quite some some hurdles to uh, to, to to achieve this um, including um, well uh, uh, consumers who are concerned about uh, the environmental um, impact of uh, animal agriculture um, may prefer other solutions than improving efficiency by breeding, um, in particular uh, just switching to uh, uh, um, a diet which contains fewer animal products um, or even to uh, uh, an all plant-based um, uh, diet. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and whereas uh, consumers uh, who just want to keep on eating uh, meat m uh, may not be concerned about these uh, uh, yeah, societal issues. And then in the second group... We, um, yeah, we continued this discussion, so what can we do to prevent uh, or, uh, or sorry, uh, to, to um, conquer these hurdles um, and it was mentioned uh, that, um, well, maybe the demands on breeding are not always reasonable in the sense that, well, y y uh, efficiency is already qu quite high and we all have all kinds of other um, breeding goals as well, which need to be weighed against efficiency. Um, but the super animal, which uh, addresses all these breeding goals to uh, an optimal extent, uh, extent doesn't exist. Um, and uh, maybe um, in uh, the developed world, um, efficiency is not the breeding goal that should receive the most weight. Um, there are also all kinds of, of other breeding goals, including um, uh, welfare traits uh, that uh, may deserve priority. Um, but um, in developing countries, efficiency may be uh, an important goal to focus on. Um, um, although it's currently quite uh, challenging to uh, to improve the efficiency of animal agriculture in developing countries, um, because uh, yeah, the infrastructure is, is is missing to implement breeding uh, breeding techniques, uh, but also uh, the the knowledge to uh, collect data in a, in a suitable way, um, and uh, uh, yeah. All, all, all kinds of hurdles um, in, in, in that respect. Um, but there were also practical steps and stakeholders that could be, uh, um, uh, could help to address these, these, these issues. So, um, yeah, the, the, the main message was we need to sort of collaborate more with local uh, people in developing countries and not just the, uh, the, 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 uh, um, uh, universities and other knowledge institutes, but also farmers, people on the ground, uh, to to see um, how, uh, yeah, what their needs are and how efficiency could be improved um, in ways that uh, that suit them. So that was uh, the main message, I think. Thank you so much. Um, well, the, the, the table I, I hosted um, in in the first round, we we actually had. Two, two big issues. One, one was um, all kind of, of issues that were are linked to um, the the high tech solutions we use in, um, in in breeding, and then specifically also on on genome editing. Um, and the other was more specifically on the use of animals, um, also um, in terms of um, animal experimentation. Um, where the, 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 the first was, um, of course, um, uh, the uh, existing legislation we, we have um, with regard to genome editing, um, but, but also in terms of um, 
well, you could say um, th there are all kinds of frames and ideas um, and misinformation on um, what we think um, is going on um, in breathing, and then the, the, the we is not so much the we as we are here, but um, the outside world. Um, and where maybe the, 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 the main hurdle was um, we, we got the impression that um, legislation or at least policy is sometimes designed um, based on information that is um, maybe 20 years old. Um, and, and how could we um, in, improve that? Um, and the other point was um, how the hurdle with um, animals and especially um, experimental animals, um, how could we come to a situation where that is more tailor-made um, to the demands that um, are specific to um, using animals as, as a, a goal animal. Yeah, so um, um, uh, the EU directive is very much designed as um, a way to, to um, regulate um, lab animals for mainly medical or safety issues um, rather than for the work um, which is going on in, in breeding. Um, the, the last point um, did it made it um, in, in the second round because already the, the first one took um, a, a lot of interesting discussion. Um, in a very practical way, the idea was how to overcome that problem of ba building or designing a policy on, let's say, um, old um, information of, of disinformation. Um, first was to say, well, we need to do um, education um, starting um, already on, on a young age. Um, at the same time in the discussion then it was also a little, little bit um, not so much nuanced that that was not important but say it, there should be more because um, what do you need to educate and, and who and then was we'll okay of course science needs to play an important role um, but media uh, plays um, a, a role as well sometimes in a specific way of framing um, but it was also mentioned as um, as one of the stakeholders in practical steps um, for instance, examples um, with uh, television programs um, where um, farming and, and farmers are uh, portrayed um, in, in a um, not, not necessarily only positive way, uh, but that you start to um, attach to what is going on. And I think that was one of the main messages um, was um, let's try to communicate in, in an honest way. <coughs> um, so there was a little bit of, where is it, um, a, a discussion, for instance, on the small picture here on the, on the gene switch, where you have um, the farm with, with the pigs outside, um, uh, 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 low density, uh, which looks nice, um, but which is not the, the real picture um, of what's going on and what we're doing. So also to um, maybe a, a point for, for us here, but, but also with um, all kinds of stakeholders, if we start to communicate, um, try to, be, to, to tell the honest picture. And that's one. And the other point was to say that might not um, convince everyone. Um, and that's um, maybe um, an, another concrete step that we said we try to um, be explicit as possible um, about where you stand for. So, so if, and I think it was mentioned as well, um, if um, we have a discussion with others who really are in favor of um, a animal-free diet, um, th that's a, 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 a legitimate standpoint, um, but there you, you cannot convince someone uh, telling that in terms of animal welfare what we're doing is quite good. And so um, try to be um, both as transparent in, in the way of how we communicate with each other, but also uh, don't um, come up with um, two nostalgic pictures um, that only would add to, to that hurdle um, we defined. So that was, was it, um, and, and, and the interesting thing is, of course, that we, we collected um, a, a lot of interesting discussion that we didn't uh, further explore. Um, so um, it, although we, we try to be um, as, as concrete or practical as possible, um, it's, of course, only scratching the surface. But what, what we hoped with this was um, to make at least the societal and ethical issues um, a little bit more practical um, and then immediately you, you see that it's not um, um, a kind of single owner. You cannot say, well, now you are a farmer and, and now you have to deal with the ethical issues or um, that I can look to you and say, okay, well, you're a scientist, now you have. So it's, it's really a joint um, activity which on the one hand makes it easy to 
step aside and say, well, um, it's not me, it's, it's you. Um, so, so collective action problems also are, are a problem, I would say, in, in dealing with, with the ethical issues. But um, did we really need um, each other and, and also reach out to um, other stakeholders to deal with it? Question. We, ha we had a, a, a formal closing of this session. I don't know. Um, I think. Do you need, or, or do, will you? Yeah, I'll stay here. Yeah. You can stay yeah. here. Okay. So it's like the witness that we should give to. <laughs> right? Something like that. <laughs> we didn't prepare anything. Did you prepare any statement? No, just thanks all the people today that contributed to the, to the workshop and to the ex exchange we had and uh, and finally to get this, uh, these conclusions. Uh, it was really nice to mix the two projects, I think, and to get a uh, different point of view, to see also how Geronimo is following what we have done for GeneSwitch in a different way, but complementary way. And uh, it's nice to see that what we have done is still living with others and also with us, but we are still working on GeneSwitch after, I think, the end of the project. But um, uh, it's also followed by, by others with other questions, and this is really a, a good aspect of, of the clustering of, of these projects. Same here. I think uh, we made a very good job, and we we were able to to keep in the big picture and to to co-build with other with others the the big picture. This is continuing, and uh, Geronimo is taking the the lead now. Let's say for going further also with other projects that will follow and also from my side of course again a big thanks to everybody who contributed and was here and presented and all also in in the whole course of aging switch project thank you yeah just the two words before lunch <laughs> no, i think it's we really see how throughout time and thanks also to to Erufang, the different projects that might be interested in different species and up to I don't know, a few years ago, it was hard to imagine a sort of talking between uh, species. Now it becomes possible. I think uh, there, is, there are really bridges <laughs> between projects and uh, a lot of exchange and uh, a lot of uh, exchange of methods, but also of ideas that um, I think is something extremely constructive for, for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>